Hello everyone and welcome to the Coast to Coast Sports Talk. I'm your host Kristen Karam and alongside me are the dazzling analysts Cameron Collins and Dave Miller. Lot to talk about so we're gonna get started. With championship week coming up there's a lot of talk on which team will be the number one overall seed for the big dance. Dave, who do you think is most deserving of this seed? Well Florida has won over 20 games in a row now they're undefeated in their conference in the SEC but then there's also the talk for Wichita State who's gone undefeated but playing in the Missouri Valley Conference they don't really have much competition down there and the rise of Villanova has been kind of shocking as well, but I don't think they're going to be in the talk for the number one seed. And Arizona also seems like a team that could be in the discussion, but with a couple of bad losses and a rivalry loss to Arizona State, I don't think that's going to help them out. So I think it's just going to be between Florida and Wichita State. Uh, depending on what happens this week, I think it's going to be Florida, unless they get upset in the first round in the SEC tournament. And if Wichita State goes undefeated, I feel like and when Florida loses, I feel like Wichita State will get it. But as of now, I think Florida will be getting that number one seed overall. Um, I'm very torn. Um, I think Florida's going to get the number one seed. But as for who I think deserves it, I, I really think Wichita State deserves it over Florida just because of the fact that even, even with, you know, the lower level of competition, finishing a season undefeated has just been proven to be a very uh, tough, attainable task. You know, only, was it like three other teams before this have had undefeated regular seasons, and Wichita State's the first team to have an undefeated regular season of 30 wins or more. Mm -hmm. And so... 32nd. 30, okay. And so, um, you know, to, to complete that goal and to finish the season undefeated, not have a single blemish on your record, I just don't see how you can give anyone else the number one seed when a team didn't lose. You know, and I mean, and that's the, the nature of the beast when it comes to college sports, you know, and that's kind of what we've complained about for years with the uh, BCS and football is, you know, you have a team undefeated, but if the voters think that they played in fear of competition, you can have a team with a loss, you know, up ahead of them. So I do think Florida probably will take the number one overall seed, which, um, you know, based on level of competition, they, they probably do deserve. But I definitely would have liked to have seen Wichita State get the number one seed for that undefeated regular season, I'd like to see that be rewarded. But, you know, they might be able to make a run in the tournament, and it won't matter if they're the number one overall seed. See, I, with Wichita State, and you, like, I know they did go undefeated, but you look at the level of talent they went up against. Was it really even a competition sometimes? They, <laughs> I mean, they did blow out their competition most of the time, which maybe they could get a number true. one seed with that. But Florida's playing in the SEC, so they still got to play Kentucky. And they still got to play LSU, and then LSU's not that great of a team, but all, just the SEC as a whole is nowhere near like what they are in football. But they it's still some good competition down there, and to go undefeated in your conference, in a strong conference as well, I think that's going to be over a, a mid-level uh, conference like the Missouri Valley. Yeah, and I mean, like I've mentioned before, you know, whether you're a number one seed, a number five seed, a number ten seed, if you are the best team in college basketball. It's, it doesn't matter because you should be able to beat whoever comes up against you and go on and win the national championship. If you can't, you didn't deserve to be there. You're not the best team. So regardless of seed, you know, it, it's all about who shows up you know, on that day and who plays the better game of basketball. The Slippery Rock men's basketball season came to an end this past Tuesday against Gannon, the number one seed in the West. Cameron, how would you rate this year's performance by the guys? Um, well, we talked about this on uh, Dave's radio show, and I, I, I'll say the same thing I said there. I think they kind of underachieved a little bit. Um, you know, they did lose a lot of talent with the seniors leaving from last year, but I still, from games I watched in person and from performances, you know, I've seen the stats and whatnot, I just think that this team had enough talent on it to go a little further. 
you know, not necessarily make the kind of run that last year's team made, but just to, you know, games like the double overtime loss to Gannon and, you know, games like the season finale against IUP where they just didn't make their foul shots and they just didn't have any sort of defensive presence underneath. That's the kind of stuff you didn't see last year. And I think that this team has the talent or had the talent to accomplish those things, but they just didn't, you know, didn't perform. So, um, it, I mean, it wasn't a bad season by any stretch, but I just think they could have done better with the talent that they had had they performed a little bit better. Like we had just mentioned, you know, you might have the better team, might have the better talent, but you have to come out and perform to your ability. You, I compare this team to last year's team, and I can no way see how this team underachieved. Because you look at the talent that they lost last year with eight seniors, three of them now playing in international professional leagues with Devin Taylor, Darius Clark, and Luis Santos, it's hard to replace that. But when you have Maurice Lewis Briggs come in and Josh Martin kind of be a, a quarterback on the field and having Tavari Perry, a three-year starter as well, and Saquon Davis coming off the, ba off the bench as another point guard, it doesn't really fulfill the void as what Devin Taylor, Darius Clark, John Bayardell, Aub Aubin Reese, Luis Santos, and many others left. So they had a lot of gaps to fill. They had Max Ren step up, who did a hell of a job this year. Uh, Monte Delanac was, he, had, he was a good spark plug for some games. In the, uh, in the Gannon game, he went 0 for, but in the game before, that's what kind of helped him beat Seton Hill. He put up 17 off the bench. So this team, I can't say they underachieved, but I want to say that they, they did their best, honestly. And I think there was, I, they just fell at the end. They could have been higher, but it came down to free throws at the end, and that's what's going to be key. Shooting 72, shooting 72 percent going in to the final game against IUP, and shooting consistently under 70 percent, under 65 percent in their IUP game, the Seton Hill game, and the Gannon game. It just came down to a couple shots from the free throw line. So uh, this team played well underneath. They were second in rebound margin, rebound margin per game. With over 10 per game, they would out-rebound their opponents. So I feel like it's not, not an underachievement, but this team had a lot going for them, and it just fell apart. So I want to say this year was a success, but it could have been a lot better. Definitely. Former Penn State assistant football coach Mike McCleary has come out and said that he was sexually abused as a child. Dave, what do you think about the situation and about his brevity? Um, it, it changes a lot for me that the fact that he actually saw the actions with Jerry Sandusky and that young child that day, and to say that he, this actually happened to him before, I, I don't know from personal experience, a lot of people don't, but I can only imagine what he was going through thinking he wanted to do something, but he couldn't because maybe no one was there for him. So he was there, he shocked, maybe he had a flashback and couldn't do anything about it. So, and now it kind of, turns the table on Mike McQuarrie, saying maybe he didn't deserve the punishment of the acts in Penn State. But the fact of the matter is that he still saw what he saw, and to not report it to any authorities or anything like that and let it go on is still a negative situation. So um, for maybe for future employment, this will work out for McQuarrie to get another coaching job somewhere. But it, I can understand like why he didn't do what, he, what everyone expected him to do now. So I... I think this is great for McQueer to come out and say this and maybe start a, you can get like a charity foundation or anything like that. But for, for now, I think this will open up his chances now for employment. Yeah, uh, I definitely think it, it at least somewhat explains, you know, his actions at the time as to why, you know, he didn't say anything. Because I definitely think, you know, probably if you were to talk to you know anybody who's gone through sexual abuse it's probably kind of been instilled in them as to keep quiet you know that's why you know a lot of these cases you know we don't hear of anything until somebody else speaks up and then you know the abused you know will affirm it that it happened you know so for him being somebody who you know has gone through this it's kind of just been through his you know through his whole life oh you know well don't say anything you know, keep quiet about it. And as you said, you know, maybe flashback when he saw this, you know, saw these events be, uh, taking place, you know, he flashed back to his own experiences and just painful memories. And it was just easier for him maybe to just block it out, you know, rather than uh, go 
tell somebody, talk to somebody, and have to go through these, you know, recurring painful memories every time he had discussions about it. Um, but I definitely agree with you. Uh, it probably will help him a lot for future jobs um, that he did come out about this because I think it's going to change a lot of people's perceptions as to uh, why his actions were what they were, as to why he didn't report to anybody. And so um, not saying that, you know, he didn't deserve his dismissal from Penn State, but it probably will help him in the future with getting a coaching job somewhere else and change a lot of people's attitudes towards Mike McQuarrie as to his actions regarding that situation. We're going to take a quick commercial break, but we still have a lot to talk about, so stick around. We'll see you in a minute. Hi, welcome to The Grove. The Grove features amenities that no other off-campus apartments can offer. Our two, three, and four bedroom apartments are fully furnished with a desk, full-size bed, dresser, nightstand, dining room set, kitchen with all appliances, and a washer and dryer for each apartment. It also includes a private walk-in closet and bathroom. All utilities are included in your lease. We are a fully gated community with on-site maintenance, security, and management. We are also pet friendly, so bring your furry friends with you. Life at the Grove will also include a resort-style swimming pool, free coffee bar, a volleyball court, 24-hour gym, and tanning, with so much more to offer. For more information, stop by today and talk with a friendly employee for a free tour and consultation. We look forward to seeing you soon. Welcome back, everyone. We have three more topics to talk about, so let's get started. The NFL's competition committee is proposing to penalize players for using abusive language during their games, specifically the N-word. Cameron, what's your take on this? Um, well, me, me and Dave and some others have already discussed this before, but um, I'll stick with my take on it is that I don't like it at all because, you know, not only do we already have issues with <clears throat> how much referees are catching with their eyes, and then now they have to try and watch everything that's going on in the field and hear what the players are saying. Um, and then to go along with that, I just think to try and govern how, you know, these players speak on the field is just kind of demeaning to them, honestly. You know, you're paying them millions and millions of dollars. You know, this is, a, it is an entertainment industry, not saying that hearing, hearing those words is entertaining, but if you try and censor players, it's going to, you know, kind of affect them on the field, might affect their gameplay, because their head's going to be in a completely different place. They're going to be focused on, oh, I got I to gotta watch my mouth as they're trying to make a hit, make a play, remember their assignment. And so, and I just think, you know, it's just kind of wrong to try and, you know, censor what they're saying uh, with a penalty. I don't think that a fine would be a big deal. That's my only part of it, that if they are really against this, they want to kind of set a standard for, well, we're not going to tolerate, you know, abusive language or anything like that, that maybe fines would be okay. But in-game penalties, I think, is just wrong because it's not, it has nothing to do with the game going on. So to, you know, penalize a team, you know, move the ball back for something that a player says, you know, just to another player out loud, you know, obviously, you know, like you can't berate officials. You're going to get penalized for that, those kinds of things. But, I mean, if they really do want to ban certain, you know, certain speech, um, throw a small fine on it, you know, either players are going to say, well, I'm, I'm okay with getting fined once in a while, and they're just going to do their thing. And some players, if they're concerned, they're going to watch what they say a little bit. Um, Richard Sherman had a great point on this, saying that he felt like he was targeted personally by the NFL only going after that one word that you mentioned earlier. Um, but I believe, if I, re if I remember the article, that if you, you look in the European Soccer League, if you say anything like racially abusive to any of the players, it's a 10 game ban. So they already try to set that standard over there, and now the NFL is trying to do this as well. But the way I view it personally, uh, one of a one of my friends brought it up, and I agreed that George Carlin said, words will always just be words. It's the context in which you use them. Yeah. It's how they can be viewed as harmful or not. But I feel like if you're in a professional football league, it, anything can happen. There's adrenaline on the field. There's 
people hyped up in all this that if you're going to take away like what some people can say on the field, then I feel like that's wrong. It it goes it's different in a professional workplace when you're not yeah. like, when it's not in an entertainment field. Because there there's been movies that say the word constantly, but that's fine. But if you're on the football field and you say it and now your team's gonna be punished, I feel like it it's gonna go both ways. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big extremist I'm a, against this new penalty, but I, it's just you gotta let it go sometimes. And I think well, and I think the biggest thing is if if football professional football wasn't such a widely broadcast thing, and if they had a 100% guaranteed way to make sure that it was never picked up by a microphone ever, I don't really think it would be an issue. You know, we saw this. Um, I don't remember if it was in the playoffs or at the end of the season in baseball last year with Victor Martinez and Grant Balfour exchanging F-words at each other, picked up by the mics. Everyone heard it because it was live television. Well, I mean, and here's the thing. You've had, I've seen altercations like this. A-Rod got hit by a pitch, and you could see both of them yeah, with the catch absolutely. of Jason attack, and you could clearly see what they were saying. You cannot control emotion on the field exactly. like that. So if it does get picked up, then penalize it, then find them. How about that? Yeah, and when but, you have sport and competition, you know, you're going to have stuff like that. And kind of what I mentioned to you before, like with professional bowling, you know, where they mic up a lot of the competitors, you can just have them sign, you know, a, a form stating that I will refrain from, you know, such and such speech. You violate that, you're fined, you know. So if they want to go and have all the players sign, you know, some sort of document stating that they will refrain from use, using certain words, you know, then then if they break that, you can fine them. But like I said, I just think a, an on-field penalty for it is just out of the question. Well, that's what Ryan Clark even came out and stated that he's not a big user of the word, but he would never, like, none of the players on the team go into the front office and say it or yeah. go into a professional and that, setting. And it's just when they're on the field. Yeah. It's just because it's that adrenaline rush Absolutely. and it's that that we see. So It's just like, you know, you'll have the most, you know, clean speech person. You know, they might go out and play a game of football, play a game of basketball. You get frustrated. You you might drop one of those words every now and then just in frustration. It's just, you know, our, our nature. You know, there's no, and these words are only interpreted the way they are because they're what we as a society have made them to be over years and years. You know, I mean, that word itself doesn't even mean what it's used as. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I said, I mean, if they want to have some way to, you know, maybe find the players, so be it. But to have it be a penalty is a little, I think, over the top. All-Pro cornerback Champ Bailey was released by the Denver Broncos earlier this week, ending a 10-year run with the team. Dave, do you think this is it for him? It could be, but I feel like he's going. he still has a lot of talent in himself that he'll try to still get that run for the Super Bowl. That was his only Super Bowl appearance with the Denver Broncos this year, and for him to go out on that note and then be released, by the Denver Broncos to make cap space because he was projected to make nine million in the salary plus um, a five hundred thousand dollar like roster bonus plus a million dollars like uh, bonus as well. So it cut it trims a lot of the fat in the salary cap for the Denver Broncos. But I I feel like he's going to go out there and try to find <coughs> another team. I, I still believe he has like another three years in him because this is the first time he even went down with an injury. He had a foot injury that cost him majority of the season, majority of the playoffs, but did get to play in the Super Bowl. So, Champ Bailey's still a top 10 cornerback in the league. He'll, he'll be a hot commodity in the free agency market. And, I mean, the Pittsburgh Steelers do need some quarterback help, so. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'd necessarily say he's a top 10 cornerback in the league, <clears throat> but I definitely don't think he's done. Um, I've heard that he doesn't have any intention of being done. Um, I think maybe going and uh, kind of maybe converting over to safety because he has lost a couple steps over the years, but that's really all he's lost is speed, which is going to happen with age. And so, you know, if he moves to, to, you know, a free safety, a strong safety where he gets to be back a little further and become more of like a Palomalu kind of either, you know, run stopping slash kind of deep coverage guy where he's already back a little bit, you know, I think he can get four or five more years out of himself you know he's played at a high level for his entire career even including last year being his age 
And um, I've even heard mentions of maybe him heading back to um, uh, his hometown to maybe finish his career in Atlanta. So, and, uh, so maybe head over to the Falcons and uh, maybe finish out his career there. But I definitely don't think Champ Bailey's done. Maybe needs to transition his game a little bit to a different position or just you know, kind of change his style a little bit. He's not going to be able to run with uh, some of those speedster receivers. But um, I definitely think he's got years left for sure. With 21 days until opening day, spring training is starting to come to a close and fans are getting excited. Cameron, who do you think the favorites are for this year's season? Um, I definitely think the Nationals probably have to be one of them. Um, you know, they kept the majority of their team intact, especially offensively, and, you know, they added the likes of Dan Heron to their uh, rotation and uh, Doug Fister in that deal with uh, the Tigers. And so, you know, they've got... You know, five starting pitchers who could be, you know, a one or a two on any staff. So when you've got your number five guy going out there every fifth day against, you know, somebody else's number five, but your pitcher is, a, you know, a number two quality pitcher, as Fister could be for most teams, um, you're, you're going to win a lot of games that way. And uh, if, they, if they can stay healthy, because that was most of the issues they had last year, was health. Um, LaRoche was in a big slump last year. Um, Harper had some health issues. Ryan Zimmerman had some health issues. But um, they ha still have a great bullpen. Uh, if they can stay healthy, they can definitely be uh, a force to be reckoned with in the NL. And uh, I even think Boston still has uh, a lot of firepower left in them, you know, keeping Ortiz. They lost Ellsbury and Salta Lamakia. But, you know, I still think they have a lot of guys, um, definitely some interesting prospects in Xander Bogarts and uh, Will Middlebrooks, some interesting uh, young players who I think are going to be uh, big contributors for years to come, and I still think they uh, have a real shot at uh, making a run this year as well in the American League. Yeah, with lo losing Jacoby Ellsbury, they can still bounce back and have Jackie Bradley Jr. step up. He was supposed mm -hmm. to come up last year, but he didn't do well at the beginning, so they had him stay back in AAA. Played pretty well against the Pirates on Sunday. and uh, So I, I have to agree, the Red Sox still have the most firepower. They didn't really lose much. They only gain from here on forward. They're, they're using their farm system as well to rise up, and in the in the NL, the Atlanta Braves are still amazing out there. But with the uh, with Chris Medlin, you know what happened to him? Yeah, strained forearm. Uh, have to stay tuned on you know how that affects him. That can be a big hit to their lineup for sure. And mm -hmm. uh, Beachy had to come out of a start today as well due to some uh, arm pain, but. Definitely, if that if their lineup can stay intact, yeah, and you look their at rotation. Freddie Freeman got an extension. He's always put up monster numbers there at the first base position, and also Chris Johnson is he batted he batted in almost every single position there. Batted eighth, batted fifth, batted second, batted I think maybe even lead off once. So and he was in the contention for the bat, batting title for most of the year. So the Braves are always one of the talks for the end of the year for the October run. But I want to, and I part of me wants to say the Dodgers as well. But I don't think they're gonna, they're not gonna have the run like they did last year to go forty. It's hard not to say the Dodgers. Games. Yeah, with all the. But with, you just have that feeling that they're gonna let you down. With somehow. all, yeah, I mean, Don Mattingly was put up for Manager of the Year because he turned around the season when they were like twenty nine and fifty seven, and then all but, of a sudden. But they should never have been in that position. Exactly. With the amount of talent that they have. So I believe the the Braves are probably the the team to look out for right now. Yeah, and they did lose, you know, they lost Brian McCann, mm -hmm. but they have Evan Gaddis, who, you know, proved he can be a, a big power bat in the lineup, so he can fill in at that catcher spot. You know, did a lot of uh, play in the outfield last year to kind of, you know, make some room to get him in the lineup. But uh, I think one of the big factors for the Braves is going to be um, Justin Upton, Upton and B.J. Upton because, you know, Justin Upton had that, you know, ridiculous Monster start April, yeah. to the season, and then he kind of cooled off, and B.J. Upton kind of struggled all year. If they can kind of find that middle ground and just both play, you know, to their regular ability, I think that that's more than enough to help out the Braves lineup. If you know they both just just produce regularly, you know, neither of them getting a real slump, I think that's going to be big for for the Braves. And uh, if Freddie Freeman can, you know, finally break out and have you know a stellar season, which I think he's capable of doing, um, the Braves are going to be dangerous for sure. Come come October. Once they get that first baseman, look out for the Pirates, too. <laughs> hey, yeah, the Pirates, uh, I don't think are going to be a slouch this year either. You know, might not be, you know, coming into the season viewed as a force, but I still think they have plenty of weapons with those young pitchers 
for sure. You know, it was a, a hit losing Burnett, but, um, you know, I definitely still think they've got plenty of firepower to compete this year as well. Okay, let's hope so. That's all that we have for you guys this week. We hope you enjoyed the show. Remember to like us on Facebook and check out the other shows on our YouTube channel as well. For the Coast to Coast Sports Show, I'm Kristen Karam. We'll see you guys next time.